people really seek it. Maybe they think it's job security, but I think there is such a thing as income security. I just don't think we find it in a job today. The economy, the company you work for, your employer, there's just, there's so many variables. So if, if we're really seeking security, security to me is money that's going to come in, hopefully at a point where whether I'm working or not. Every student, you know, whether it's a new program, a new coach, a new system, whatever it is, uh, we always went back to fundamentals. What's cracking like it, everybody? Good afternoon. Money Smart Guy, Matt Spala here. Hailing to you from the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel here at our headquarters here in Oak Brook Terrace, Illinois, the direct west suburb of downtown Chicago. I'm here with my good friends Diana and Kelroy, Joe Kohatsu. <laughs> and uh, we want to share with you some of uh, some of the success they've had here, adjusting, pivoting, adapting, and obviously overcoming, and how they made $500,000 here in the middle of the pandemic. Diana, Kelroy, what's up? How you doing? Hey there. Man, so cool. By the way, um, uh, uh, Carol, let's start with ladies first. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, uh, Diana tell everybody about your background, your career, your ethnic, uh, your your hybrid, you know, uh, ethnic background. Tell everybody so we can get to know about you. Sure. So, uh, hybrid is a good way of putting it. I'm half Chinese, half everything Caucasian. Um, my parents met back when they were in church. I think it was like junior high or something. I hope I hope I got that one right. Um, and went that traditional route of get good grades, uh, played a lot of sports, was competitive in both of those, school and in sports. Went to college, I went to University of Southern California, and I started as a pre-med student, and I lasted not even a whole semester of biology and said, what am I doing? I don't even like science. And so called on my parents and said, I'm switching majors. And then, you know, are you going to be a doctor? It, no. Okay. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be, you know, they name all the, the, the traditional right. routes. Yep. And I said, actually, I'm going to be a fine art major. And it was just quiet on the other end of the phone. I think. Crickets. Um, Crickets. Yeah. So I don't know if my dad muted me and he, you know, was yelling profanity on the other end or if he didn't even know what fine arts meant. But um, they, I've always been blessed with supportive parents when I've done crazy things. And so got a degree in art. I was working in uh, the nonprofit world at an art museum. And everyone would say, hey, you're doing so well. You know, you've got a, a good job. You got a salary. You work in a fancy city. And I was paycheck to paycheck. I was, you know, had $90,000 in student loan debt. And so I thought, if wow. this is success, it doesn't feel very successful. So I actually got started in the financial industry more just to learn about money for myself. As soon as the word, you know, finance or numbers or sales or business, those were things that were so far from me. And so I thought there's no way this can be something I'm good at. Uh, but if you're willing to teach me, I'm willing to learn. And uh, just fell in love with purpose of, of how it's able to help everybody. I look forward to when there's a day that, you know, every, it's normal in third and fourth grade that we're learning about finances, but it just isn't in our society yet. Um, and, you know, you, you a decade later, here I am, uh, excited, met my husband in this industry, and we're running a crazy competitive business that sometimes feels more like sports than it does yeah. finance or insurance. Um, yeah. And just really grateful. That's awesome. By the way, you, play, you played soccer, right? You played mm -hmm. soccer? So you played soccer at the D1 level? At, uh, at, uh... I, can't, I can't say I'm, I'm that good. I was gotcha. pretty competitive. I, I didn't play it when I was in college. I, gotcha. I know uh, Patrick, but David, he would always say, oh, no, no, no. It sounds better that you, you play, play it. <laughs> I, I played club soccer when I was at USC, but I didn't play it on the SC team. I wish, I wish. So it was one of those things where, you know, kind of look back and it, what if you had just given it your best shot? And huh. that was one of those regrets of I didn't, try and take it all the way interesting very cool but that's awesome though to be a be able to club soccer at usc so awesome now now yeah now uh Kelroy, i mean you you got some you got a football background tell everybody about you know your background too as well your ethnic combination the last yeah. thing what? Well, so we grew up on spam right in hawaii uh <laughs> we're originally born out and raised out there and um you know i think a lot of times when people i, I was kind of funny we were on the call earlier and you were talking about how and then you and Shane just went to Hawaii and, and we, you know, PHP has all these, like, that's our next company trip. And 
a lot of people who have never been there usually think of like the postcard lifestyle, like that stuff. But there's so many so many parts out there that you had like our city. We had one stoplight, and it was because you weren't supposed to stop anywhere in that city. <laughs> you supposed to just drive right through. We on Hilo? We on Hilo or you on Oahu? On Oahu. On Oahu. In fact, where um you know the fifty first states. Right, that yeah. that movie with Adam Sandler, when he, when the place that he worked at, was filmed down the street from where I live, and so that was kind good of good cool. movie. By the good movie, by the way, it's, it's, it's a very, <laughs> good, very yeah. good romantic movie, man. So uh, for all the romantic movie buffs out there, I know Sheena's like, oh, I love that movie. <laughs> but then it's yeah, I came up, moved to Cali. I got recruited to play football out here. I was playing at Azusa Pacific. It was a lot of fun, and I was really just trying to. I don't know. I think I, I hated school. I didn't want to do any paperwork, testing, any of that stuff. I just was trying to get out and I was trying to just leave, do something different. And um, that's how I ended up in California. I thought the easiest route to get a degree and go play football was to become a teacher, a PE teacher, where I'm still getting to play the game. <laughs> um, I already know the game, so it's going to be easy testing. And uh, I can go work with the youth. Like we'll, we'll run around and have some fun. And that's kind of like what I thought was going to be like, hey, my calling and then you realize teachers don't make any money and you think teachers get paid bad but football coaches get paid even worse uh, i think it's like 39 cents an hour that we got compensated for as a football coach in high school and i just really stumbled into this industry by accident i don't know i think god opened up a door and boom here we are i don't think anybody wakes up thinking yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna get into the financial industry uh, especially when we didn't have a lot of finances or money to begin with growing up, you know, but extremely grateful, extremely grateful for it. So Andrew, we, you, you have, uh, so what we have here, we have artist and gym teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a great resume to start making half a million dollars a year in the insurance industry. So uh, I, I, I want to be able to share that right quick. So this is Diana, Joe and Carroy crossing this year, over half a million dollars in cash flow. Some of my God. You're in the top 1% of income. Welcome to the top 1% of income in America. I think it's 464 in Illinois. I think it's like maybe 482 there in California. But listen, then practically half your income goes to taxes anyway. So, uh, Dan, let me start with you. I mean, you crossed half a million bucks. What's your initial feeling? How, how does it feel to be uh, at this type of category, especially in the midst of a pandemic where, where, <coughs> excuse, where, <coughs> where businesses are contracting? And people, and people are getting laid off, but yet your business is growing and, and, and attracting more people to work, work with it from different, different professions too as well. Incredibly grateful. Um, and I remember a long time ago when I was looking to transition out of my W-2 job working in nonprofit. And he, this, this gentleman, he had asked me a question. He said, you know, do you feel like you're overworked and you're underpaid? And I feel like I fell into this trap and I said, yes, you know, I'm this great employee. They should pay me more. And he said, actually, you're paid exactly what you're worth. And it was like a shot to the gut. Um, and he said, look at it less about um, the impact that you're making, maybe just for that company, but what's the impact that you're making in society? If you want to make more money, you just got to increase your impact. You got to increase your influence. And so I kind of similar to Kelroy, you know, I feel like this industry just sort of fell into my lap. I wasn't looking for it, but it just made sense. I was really nervous about it because it seemed so different from what I had done before. Mm -hmm. But what I fell in love with was what a difference it made for me of just learning about how I can take better control of my finances. And it was an easy hey, can you teach this to other people, what you're learning? Uh, yeah, I, I think that I can. And then you incorporate this year, this level of, I want to call it competition. I don't, I don't know what else it is, but I think when this pandemic hit and you, know, you, you could choose a few different ways of going about it, you could freeze, you could run in the other direction, you could flee, or you could fight. And I think for Kelroy and I, there have been enough instances in our lives where things seem really uncertain. You're not so sure what's going on. And it's like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to double down. I'm going to work harder, be clearer than I've ever been before. And we've honestly had more fun, honestly, this year too, because I think people are really open to, yeah, how can I, how can I make sense of this uncertain time? And yep. that's, I hope that answered your question. I think sure. it did. <laughs> yeah, Roy, anybody in your family making half a million bucks a year? No, no, 
Nobody, nobody, nobody in the, the, the land of paradise. By the way, but a, a funny story, funny side story. You remember that year where the Aztec calendar was supposed to, um, what do you call it, expire and the, the world was supposed to end? You, you remember that year? I think it was like 2000, maybe 2010. Uh, the, 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 the Mayan, anyway, mm -hmm. if this calendar is supposed to end. The guy took out a paper, uh, an ad in the paper. The world is going to end. When, when was it again? Do you, do you remember that? 2010, 2012. Okay, the mind calendar. That's it. The mind calendar is supposed to expire. So, I I, I get a, I get booked for a speaking gig in Maui. Okay? We're going to the uh, the four. I'm speaking at the Four Seasons for Royal Neighbors of America Insurance Company. And um, I'm on this plane, and I'm like, damn, you know, on this plane, they sit at the this hour while I'm in the air on my way to Hawaii. The world's supposed to end. And so uh, I end up landing. So I'm like, okay, the world's not ending. The world's not ending. I land in Hawaii. I land in Maui. I come out the plane. Ocean breeze hits me. Just to, to, to put the lay over me. And I said, okay, I guess the world just did end because I landed <laughs> in paradise. <laughs> Beautiful out there in Hawaii, man. But I mean, the, 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 the truth to Hawaii, there's the uh, tourist area. And then there's the working class. Right? Yeah. So, Carol, I mean, how hard is it to make a living in Hawaii? Oh, my gosh, it, it is extremely hard. I mean, I think even during these times, I think what this pandemic has done is it just exposed that job security doesn't exist anymore. It's exposed how dependent we are on, like, tourism out in Hawaii specifically because nobody's coming in. They locked everything down. You know, it's a lot of jobs. That's majority of, like, the income that's generated through tourism out there. So, I mean, during these times, it's super tough for a lot of families. You know, and already you, you would see a lot of people sell their homes, move to Vegas, that's known as the Ninth Island. People would move to, uh, to Arizona, to Oregon, just to reduce their lifestyle so they can have some sort of lifestyle. You know, so, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's challenging to, to, make, to make it happen out there, for sure. I remember, I remember coming, uh, coming from Hawaii, and the, the, big, the big conversation on the island is, can't wait to get to the big island so we can go to Vegas. Yeah. Is, is that... <laughs> Yeah, is it, is that, that's it, right? I think there was a whole article, uh, there was a whole uh, video my grandma was getting interviewed because she was so upset that Vegas shut down because that was like their one place that they, they would have every year. Everybody in Hawaii wants to go there for whatever reason. Um, and, and just, yeah, that's Ninth Island. Wow. So, Dan, let me ask you a question. How, how was your money blueprint? How was your conversation about money growing up, right? Because, listen, right, there's, China has become an economic superpower, and you know, quite frankly, a lot of Chinese folks that I'm running across, I mean, a lot of them work two or three jobs, and they make a lot of money, save a lot of money, and you know, they're financially secure. How was, how was the money conversation for you growing up? My money conversation growing up wasn't a lot. I think it was, um, you know, my dad, he worked, he blue-collar guy, he was a press room operator at the Los Angeles Times newspaper. My mom worked for a big company doing money management, but for big time CEOs and companies, there wasn't a lot of personal finance talked about at home. I mean, I remember hearing my, hearing my parents argue about money, um, you know, money spent on my club soccer, very expensive. And there was no skipping, there was no skipping a, a practice. We're paying for that. You're going to go, you know, that, that was kind of the money blueprint. And then taking me to the bank to open a savings account. And I remember thinking, it doesn't really do anything. And so I always kind of just viewed as I should do that because that's what you're supposed to do, put money in the bank and save it. But it felt like prison. It felt like I'm putting my money in jail. I didn't understand that you could get your money to work hard for you too. So uh, one thing I think that I, that money blueprint that I was blessed with early on is I always watch my parents work hard. Um, I've been, I had a job since I was 15. And so that was, it was just go make it happen. But it was you go work to make money, not necessarily learning how to get money to work hard for you. Wow, that's a, prof that's a profound statement there. Kara, what's, what's some of the things when you're sitting down working with multicultural middle-class folks, uh, what, what's the area of biggest concern, especially right now during the pandemic, what would you say the biggest concern for them right now, financially speaking, is as it deals with the money, the career, the job? I think it was, I, I think from a cultural standpoint, um, it was always just, there was always a lack of, so trying to preserve um, as much as you can and versus 
switching the 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 solution to hey uh, to earning more to preserve what I have to protect what I have um, and that I think that's just culturally that's just where where what I've seen you know growing up in the place where I, I grew up and being in this industry and having these conversations where um, there's a lot of fear because it's so unknown such a it's we speak a different language you know a lot of cultures yeah. speak a different language where most a lot of times what we find is people don't understand the the money language financial language. And so that's where there's a lot, I think there's a lot of fear of just the unknown um, and people just not wanting to take that risk um, and over or even willing to understand it. Uh, just, could, but, but I feel like a lot of, a lot of it is just trying to preserve what they have versus like, Hey, really looking at the opportunity. I think even for me, looking back at where I will, you know, where I grew up and the community that the conditioning that I had growing up to now, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm super grateful for capitalism. I'm super grateful for it, for free enterprise and entrepreneurship because only during a like during a pandemic, um, we weren't limited. We we were able to go out there and create and own, not being dependent on corporate America, my school at the time. You know, like when I was a teacher, right. and I think that's where it's just challenging and reconditioning um, the the perspective, the perspective. And I think that's what culturally we go to preserve. I gotta protect. I gotta keep. Uh, versus hey, abundant. I gotta like Diana said, like making it work for me leverage what the wealth you've been doing to give me that lifestyle and freedom and peace of mind as well. Yeah, I know when you're working with clients and you're recruiting and training and, and, and you're obviously helping with leadership development, personal development with people that you're coaching and mentoring, what, what are some of the roadblocks that you're discovering throughout that process? I mean, people, you know, they, they went your route, they went to college, they went this, they get now, now they're left you know, with, with nothing or very little. How are you helping rewrite their money blueprint or the way you think about money, therefore their outcome can be much different? Uh, I think some of the roadblocks that I see a lot maybe are people thinking that they have so much time, you know, let's use like college grads, um, thinking that, you know, I, I did what I was supposed to do and now the world is supposed to open up, you know, the golden gates and it's, you know, you start at the bottom. Uh, most, I don't know what the average is today, but most, most kids out of college have start with some kind of student loan debt and they're getting paid the bottom of the barrel in terms of, of jobs. So it's, it's backward. You know, I, I had close to six figures in debt and was making 40 grand. Like that doesn't, that doesn't make yeah. sense, but you, but you think, you know, you've got all this theory in your head. So, you know, you think, oh, I know everything. You just got to give me a shot. And um, so mindset wise, it's more of just shaping, uh, Hey, you, you got, you got to take, you got to take the supposed risk and the risk, there is no real risk. I think we have it set in our mind that we're supposed to go this certain route. And then when life throws us a curveball, all of a sudden I got to think about it. You know, let me, and, and you don't really have time to think about it. I think one of the best things that we did this year was we started thinking a lot less. I don't know how else to put it, but it's like, let's just start working. Let's just start making moves. And in that experience, I think you realize so much more than theory. It's about people taking action. So that's more of, the, I think the biggest roadblock is just getting people to be willing to take whatever the next step is for them and not being scared of that. Uh, I think there's this real fear of failure um, and shoot, failure is where you learn. And I, I think we're failing if we're not taking any action, if we're not trying new things. This is such a good time for people to explore, hey, what else? Hey, maybe what I thought was gonna be my plan A, maybe it's not my plan A anymore. Maybe I should explore a plan B, C, D. And just being okay with it, trying things and improving in some area versus I've gotta fit this mold and things gotta look a certain way. Um, I think that's where we get resentful. I think that's where we get, um, frustrated because at the end of the day you know who who's in your head when you put your head on your pillow uh, hopefully it's I think it's just yours I, I think for me it's just me and I got to be good with me so I, I can't be I can't live off of the approval of others um, take some risks try some things no when, when I was uh, I, I think it was a, our trip to Costa Rica uh, was it your dad your, yeah. your dad was with you yeah so how is your dad? How how is your dad seeing your success now? You know, just to see you know the, from from this, you know, uh, club soccer, USC, fine arts, uh, uh, pre med fine arts, and now this, you know, married woman to this 
Hawaiian stud of a spam sample. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how, how's that transformation been in your dad's eyes? Uh, well, I, I think my dad secretly thinks that he is Hawaiian um, and long before Kelroy was even in the picture. So it was just a match made in heaven of, oh, okay, great. Your wedding's in Hawaii. You know, he's always wanted to retire there with my mom. And my mom says, I, I you know, the sun, I see it and I burn. So she's, she's not such the fan. She'd rather just visit. But my parents, my dad in particular, are biggest, our biggest fans. My dad has been that way. Even, even back in high school, you know, sports, he was always the one in the stands that was kicking my butt, uh, to, to work harder. And, and just, he's the, he's the family guy. He's the example of working hard. Yep. There he is. Um, working hard, smile on his face, ultimate servant leader, and um, so just seeing our success, he was texting me during our, the, the big the, uh, convention we just had and just saying, oh, I loved your talk. When are you talking again? And uh, it's just neat to see, you know, he, he always says, you know, if I was younger, you know, if I was younger, I would do this business with you. And so still working <laughs> on him of, has nothing to do with age, dad, nothing to do with age, but he's, he's our biggest fan. It's actually better to do with age, you know, all those relationships, experiences, he's, he's got to teach a hand down to the next generation. Yes. Uh, Kerroy, talk to me, man, because, listen, bro, uh, with, with me being from the outside looking in, when I heard that you are getting married to Diana Joe, man, like, what is this, where does this come from? Where does this come from, man? What? So, uh, uh, what, what, what was it about you? Because, listen, man, getting married to the right person, don't I know this, getting married to the right person is so important. Yeah. When you guys got married, man, it's like, you know, your business just went exploded like this. Your lives explode like this. You know, so I guess the first part of my question is, you know, you know, what did you, what did you, I'm going to get in here, right? What did you specifically look for in a future, you know, in a future wife? You know, what were, what were some of the, were you going through like this, you know, have, have a mental checklist or, because, you know, we talk about values and principles a lot. I think for me, it was, um, and it was so funny because I got started in this business in this industry, not with that as my number one priority. And I think that's where like, hey, when you kind of like, you know, constantly putting your space in yourself in spaces where you're, you know, trusting in God and doors open up like you never thought and it happened. But I think even for me looking for a spouse, I, I grew up where I have eight sisters. I have eight sisters. I got zero brothers. And I think even while we were growing up, I always wanted to see my sister be independent, strong will, strong minded. Um, not having to rely on or lean on, you know, anybody else for help and being just strong individuals, period. And so I think even as I was looking for a spouse, like those are strong qualities that really, uh, that, that I was always looking for. And Diana possesses all, she has all those, like strong will, strong head, like independent, someone who wasn't scared to work, someone who was willing to be on the trenches, someone who wanted to compete, you know, and that just had a fun, fun spirit. Right, God fearing, like fun spirit. That, that those are some of the qualities I like for me that I was looking for. Never thought it would I would have found it in you know in PHP. Like I remember I tell that I tell that all the time. I, say, I remember the first time that I came to an office. And I'm like, you know, I, she's wearing her green pre, you know shirt, her green president's club shirt. She had hair in the point. I was like, well, like there's a lot of good looking people here. Never thought that anything would ever happen. Like, but it's just like, um, but that was those are those are core values and, and principles that were always important to me. Um, and just finding like a running mate, a teammate, a spouse, a best friend, those sort of things. You, you didn't mention cooking skills, bro. Not one of those were top five with cooking skills. I mean, <laughs> spam with some man. It doesn't take a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, are you like Sheena, where you guys like you like master orderers, like DoorDash, and like master reheaters? Yes. <laughs> master reheaters. Yes, master reheaters. Ma I'm better better at ordering, I think, for sure. I mean, I, I love cooking. I just don't have time to do any of it. So if we're going to eat, it's probably not going to be something that I'm making very often. So yes, a lot like Sheena. Yes. Yeah, she had the same question too, Diana. I mean, your business exploded when you guys got married. You went to Hawaii. Beautiful pictures in Hawaii. I mean, I, you guys are sharing a convention. Just amazing, like, magazine-like pictures of your wedding. You know, you know what, would you, what would you say was, was going on? In, in your guys are you know your relationship that turned into a, a, to a marriage because now you're official po uh, power couple you know how important has that been for you in your business it's been incredibly important I think um, 
you know, you, you pick the right person and uh, there's, we, we've been running together as a unit a good year before this for sure. But there's, I guess there's something about when you say those vows in front of your friends and family. And now it's like really, really real. Uh, and it was the best thing. I just think God has always blessed our business, has blessed us individually. But I think that was sort of like, and now it's game time. Little did we know that there was going to be a global pandemic after that, as we're all frolicking around in Hawaii, living our best lives in February. Um, but it was even, even, um, Calroy, you can probably attest to this. It, all weddings, I think are fun. You know, there's, there's a lot of love in the room, but ours was definitely something special, especially when you bring the team that came out. I mean, just the, those that were in our, our wedding, um, that we work with in the business. One of my favorites, I think was during toasts and, you know, Andrew and Jennifer Gaines oh. and Alfredo and Crystal Garcia, who are two couples that crossed over their quarter million dollar rings and in the business. Um, part of their speech was basically, and we're going to make more money than, than Alfredo. Like I think Andrew said, and we're going to make you more money than Alfredo and Crystal. And so you've got family that are not part of our, our crazy, awesome company that are thinking, what an interesting toast, but there is competition <laughs> even in that. Uh, so I think even in that spirit of competition, really what's underlying is a team that loves each other and will go to war for each other. And it's maybe not blood family, but it's, it's, it's family. Well, that's, what was that saying, man? You know, your, your DNA, your blood connects you to your relatives. There's those that believe in you, that work with you, ride or die with you. That's your family. Yeah. You know? So, um, Kara, let me ask you this question. When, when, when you're talking about money, what's, mm -hmm. what's some of the sad misconceptions people have about our industry and what we're doing? What, what, what are some of the things you see yourself overcoming when you're talking to somebody? Hey, man, this is how you get wealthy. This is how business works. This is how the insurance industry works. Because, you know, there's a lot of misconception out there. You know, small thinking, uh, uh, highly ambitious, lazy people are very good recruiters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah. so what, what are some of the things that you, you find out there to help educate somebody to level up their game, especially right now where it's either you, you settle for that or you got to level up to, to make ends meet? I think one of the biggest misconceptions that a lot of people like just come to the table with is that commissions is bad. Like really, like commissions is not, like people have this misconception that commissions is spotty. It's, un, it's, it's like not, it's not predictable. But commissions is very predictable. Is very stable. It's people's work ethic that is not, mm -hmm. and so that's the misconception. I think one of the biggest ones where there is that fear because it's so foreign. Because we've been conditioned, hey, I work for a certain amount of hours. Like there's an expected, but you know, you you put a level, a certain level of work ethic that actually reaps you that income at the end of the week, at the end of the month. And so that I think that's one of the biggest ones. And so just trying to recondition people with like the mindset of like, no, like. Hey, there's no, there's no, there's no limit on how hard you're willing to work. We've been, we was, we've been raised to work hard. A lot of people work hard. We just never got, we never got paid what our work ethic was worth. You know, when you get into an industry like this and you realize that the like, sky's the limit, you know, I remember the first time when we made like over $60,000, like, okay, cool. Like, dang, that was kind of, that was, that was interesting. I remember when it took that and I told Diana, I said, Hey, that took me almost like two years as a teacher just to make like, wow, that's like to compress time frame because I was willing to outwork that two year time frame as a teacher and compress it into a month. Like, okay, I like, I like this, but that was because I, I, I'm willing to put in the work in an industry that's willing to pay me for, for my work ethic, you know? So, so you went from $60,000 for two years of salary to commission or yeah. self-employment income, like 60,000 in 30 days. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Diana, what about you? What are some of the misconceptions you're finding out when you're helping either assisting clients or some of the, uh, you know, with deals with insurance or retirement plan or some of the misconceptions people deal with entrepreneurship? Well, we hear a lot, you know, job security, right? And I think at least now people realize there's no such thing as job security. Uh, but what are people really seeking? You know, maybe they think it's job security, but seeking some sort of security. Um, I think there is such a thing as income security. There is something such as financial security. I just don't think we find it in a job today because there's too many 
there's too many variables that are outside of our control as say the employee economy, uh, the company you work for, your employer, there's just, there's so many variables. So if, if we're really seeking security, um, we've got to find, I'm looking at how can I, security to me is money that's going to come in, hopefully at a point where whether I'm working or not. Um, so love the, the big pay cycles, love income that is top 1% in, in the country, of course, that's, but also having something that's stable that, you know, if our, our family needs something that we can come through where Kelroy had mentioned it took him two, two years. It was, yeah, if I was making 40 grand gross annual income with a salary and salary, I think is one of those things too, that's a misconception where I remember going from hourly to salary and thinking, I'm a big girl, I'm growing up, I have a salary. <laughs> and it just means you don't get paid overtime anymore. You know, you can work 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week and now you get paid the same. And for those that have been on a salary, you usually work more like the 80 hour weeks. So I just saw, for me, the misconception, even when I, I was going down that track was if I want, I need to redefine success for me because success isn't a salary, success isn't um, employment. Um, it's me being able to live what we hear all the time, my best life. I wanna live my best life. I wanna not worry about things. I wanna make decisions based off of what's best for me and my family and not whether or not I can afford it. And you can get there. For growing up, you had asked early on, what was my money blueprint? Um, probably like a lot of families or people, I hope I'm not the only one that heard things growing up like, Diana, money doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> or, you know, what do you think we're made of money? You know, I heard a lot. That's why I was working since I was 15, because I wanted a lot of things. And so my parents said, hey, go get to work and go earn it. But I thought money was hard to come by. And it really isn't, it's just about, it's that value proposition. I was working in the wrong space that was only gonna pay me so much. And so I just needed to find a way to bring more impact. And it's kind of interesting because most people, I think are, would probably agree with me in this too, that you're not afraid of working hard if it's towards something that's purposeful. If you feel like, like you're really making a difference, you're helping somebody else, like it's energizing. It doesn't feel like work. I needed to, I just needed to find, I needed to find that. So that, that money blueprint you're talking about, you know, uh, money doesn't grow on trees. So that's a money language that's not called Chinese or Japanese, that's called brokenese. <laughs> yeah. right? that's, 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 a, that's a broken ease language. So, 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 so Carroy, you know, um, so you're, you're newest people, man. You're newest people. You know, the, the, there's, you, got a lot, you got a lot of people now coming to your business, Pasadena, you guys make it happen. What are some of the basic things that you're teaching people now? What are some of the basic core skills? That if, 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 if you learn these basic core skills, you know, you're going to get yourself here in another you know, X amount of time. You're going to be making half a million dollars like you guys too as well. I think it's uh, like, you look at like Michael Jordan, you look at Kobe Bryant and you look at from a sports career. I'm, I'm an athlete. So uh, every season, you know, whether it's a new program, a new coach, a new system, whatever it is, uh, we always went back to fundamentals. And so just kind of going back and just having these conversations with new people where you see a lot of, you know, everybody wants to flash, everybody wants like whether it's a presentation or speak really well and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but just making sure people realize, hey, what are the core fundamentals of this business? Well, one, it's, Hey, you know, introducing like meeting people, networking, you know, shaking hands. Um, basic fundamentals are just being on the fist bumping now, fist bumping now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fist uh, air five, right? Like some of those things. Uh, but just going back to the fundamentals that are really just getting in front of people and creating opportunities to expo you know, share what it is that we do and how we've been able to help a lot of families and be able to duplicate that skill set and transfer those simple skill sets. Because it's what I realized over the course of my career is like, man, I'm not the most talented person. I'm not the most smartest person. I'm not the most flashy person. Um, but you don't need you don't need to be all those things in order to really do well in in this industry. You know, it's not a talent game. It's just a work ethic thing. And you can win a championship just learning from like the basic fundamentals. Uh, Jordan would come into into the into the gym early on and shoot a thousand free throws. Kobe would do the same thing. And those are fundamental building blocks. You know that 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 someone can really do well in an industry like this with a, with a, with a you know, training program that we have, 
and just develop those things and win win big like I did. You know, awesome, Kyle Roy. You know, Diana, when when um, when when people right now are looking at where they're at financially, you know, we're we're in the uh, we're September, we're closing out the craziest year, twenty twenty. You know, that a lot of people have never experienced for multiple generations, hundred years, have never experienced something like this since the Spanish flu. But when you when you're looking at the 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 person right now, and they said, "Man, half a million dollars, really? I can barely make ends meet." You know, uh, what, what would you tell, what would you tell a person right now? Who's, who's like, they're, they're okay. I'm willing to take a stab at it, but damn, I'm skeptical or, you know, half million. That's never going to be me. What, what would you tell a person right now? Who's, who's on the fence to say, you know what, give us a shot, you know, start before you can run. Here's how you start crawling. What, what would you tell that person? I would first recommend, you know, what do you have to lose? And because again, it kind of goes back to risk. And when you really look at it, trying something new, saying yes to personal development or improvement or learning something new, giving like opening a door that could be the next chapter in your life. There's no risk there. Um, it, it really is just saying, what, what do I have to lose? And starting there. I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to be good at that. Like they, they close the door before they even get a chance to, to, to walk through it. And um, I get it. It's, it's fear of failure. Um, it's maybe, maybe past experiences of you've been, the wool has been pulled over your eyes. You know, we all come to life with the baggage from the day and years before. But if people can just say, what do I have to lose? The, the worst thing that could happen is I'm going to learn something new and I'm going to be able to make a well-rounded decision for myself that this is for me or for it's not for me. But if I never give myself the shot, I'll never know. And it kind of goes back to, Diana, you'll never know if you could have been that best soccer player at USC because you didn't try. You didn't go for it. <laughs> and so after that, I was like, you know what? I, I enjoy that position of like excited about being a rookie again. That is not a bad thing. I think sometimes the older we get, we're supposed to know everything. And shoot, that's when you know I'm going downhill if you think I know everything. I'd, I'd rather just be, there's tons that I don't know. And so I'm going to be excited like a kid on Christmas morning to open presents that what else can I learn today? And if I fall down, I'm going to get back up. And that's really all it is. I think so many people in the world today, not even just in our local communities, are feeling like they're failing in some way or not knowing how to navigate next steps. And I think having a group of people around like our environment that, that we know, that's really uplifting. And just like, hey, just give it a shot and we'll take it one step at a time. I, th I think that's, that's something that more of us need. It's not just making more money. Uh, making more money is a fantastic byproduct of deciding you want to upgrade your life. You just want to be a better version of you. It really is leadership. That's really what it is. Uh, but it just starts with saying, what do I have to lose? I'm going to, you know, people go back to school. They, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a degree. Uh, there he is. There's that man again. There's my dad. <laughs> Love that Chinese guy. And, uh, but it's, it, I think where, where you feel, feel good about, um, Hey, I, my, I'm doing something good for me and my family. Like, what do I have to lose? I'm going to give it a shot and find out for myself. I'm not going to let my decisions be based on other people's opinions or small thinking or their, their, you know, their baggage from the past. I mean, shoot, I wish we got paid for opinions. We would all be rich, but <laughs> you know, opinions are free. You got to be careful who you, who you listen to. Yep. Opinions are kind of like armpits. People got at least <laughs> two of them and they all stink. <laughs> But uh, Carol, I mean, you weren't raising money. Diana wasn't raising money. You weren't raising money. You know, um, you know the, the 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 conversation with people, uh, they think, oh man, you know, you look at Diana, oh, she, you know, perfect. Oh, the uh, Carol, oh, perfect. Their, their life's perfect. They had a head start. They got married in Hawaii. They got a head start. You know, and you did it. You guys started from the bottom. You were trainees, Patrick, but David didn't give you a head start. Matter of fact, I've he I've seen him beat you guys up yeah. i'd call on calls for five years putting pressure on you man you talk about some some uh, endurance <laughs> yes, yeah she yeah but the pressure made some diamonds carol you talk to somebody you know they're on the fence they want to do something 
they're not sure, same question to you. What would you tell them? I think it's more of like, like you just won't ever know what you're really made of. You know, you, um, we, the places we're at now are, is because of decisions we've made before. But if we want to get to the next level, we've got to shift the way that we're, think, we're thinking. Um, if not give give if not give me a shot, if not give you know the, the company a shot, the industry, at least give yourself the shot. Give yourself the opportunity to have this, to discover like the next version of you. You have no idea. The only guarantee that you know is if you decide not to, then nothing will ever change. Yeah. Um, what like what's the worst that could happen? Kind of like what Dana talked about, you know. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan that either one of two things will happen: either the world's going to break and say and give you everything you want, or you're going to break and the world's going to say, "I told you you couldn't do it." And I'm not willing to give. You know, you can't give you can't give the world the opportunity to say, "Hey, I knew you couldn't do it." Uh, maybe it's stubbornness. That's what my mom told me. It's my best quality. My best quality is how stubborn I am. And I was kind of thrown off at first. So I, like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Diane agrees. Thank <laughs> you. You know. But just don't know, not knowing, not knowing when to quit, you know. Diana, this is it. You're you're, you're retired. Five hundred thousand dollars. You're good. No way. Well, Ask Kelroy. You know when when we got the announcement, he was like, "Are are you excited?" And because I think my response was like, "Okay, awesome, cool, all right." So and we're already planning what we're doing next. It's just we're excited about. I'm determined that 2020 is going to be the best year of our life. I am determined that a decade from now, we look back and we say, you know what, there was lots of things going on during that time, but we made the most of the cards that we were dealt. And I think that's exciting. So no way, unless retirement means that I'm on course to like live my best life and, and take it to the next level, sky's the limit, then sure. But if retirement means done, heck no, just, just getting started. And that's the part that's fun that it used to be, I think a, lot, a while ago, you know, if I just had a certain amount of money in the bank or if I just had a, and you think that um, now, then, then I'll be, then I'll be good or then I'll be happy. And um, my, money's great. It is, it takes away probably 95% of the things that we used to worry about, but purpose and like competing in your own life, um, laughing at things that, you know, when you screw things up or when things don't go your way, like just having an optimistic viewpoint, even during these crazy times, I mean it, it can be done. And um, I, just getting started. So no, 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 no retirement. I love it. Tara, I'll give you, I'll give you the, 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 the final thoughts, uh, last words here. I mean, $500,000, people say, man, you sound greedy. You guys sound like you're greedy to me, man. It's like, isn't enough enough already? What would you tell them? No. I mean, I remember somebody told me if you gave a poor jerk a million dollars, what does it make him? It just makes him a wealthy jerk. I believe God's going to give us, he's, he wants to give us abundance so we can create more opportunities. And it's kind of funny when Dad's talking about like, yeah, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't phase us because I think we're in, a, we're in this space of like, I really do believe God calls to do something great or something bigger. I think there's a massive change. And I was looking for that as a teacher. I just never had a platform big enough to make that sort of impact on. And sometimes you got to be in those, you have to be in those circles. You have to have that platform. You have to put yourself in those spaces so that your voice holds weight. People want, people expect change, but aren't willing to go out there and make those changes. And these are just milestones that we're just, you know, going in that direction of making a massive impact. Uh, $500,000 is, is, is cool. It's awesome. We're extremely grateful. We're thankful, but uh, we're just getting started. And I know just by hitting this milestone, it, it just is proof that it is possible. And so if somebody's watching this and they're like, man, I don't know if I could do that. Someone's already proven that it's possible. You know, I remember when you guys got started, you guys went from like zero to a million dollars in your first like three or five years. It's like, oh, it's possible. Someone just needs to prove that it's possible for it to be possible for everybody else. And that's what we just want to be able to continue to do is make those impossibles for somebody possible because everyone deserves an opportunity. That's a cool thing about that word impossible. The word I am is in front of the word possible. Mm. I'm possible, right? So guys, I, I can't tell you how excited I am for you both, you know, making a splash in the, the awareness of the Polynesian Asian culture the attraction of our ethnic groups uh, rising up with inside the company because as we all know 52% of our company is Latino and 
the other majority is uh, African American. We're the next rising bunch in the mix, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, we're, gonna right. we're gonna have some karaoke on stage. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> We're going to have some Spamasubi. Right? <laughs> yeah. Recognition, the next level of recognition. <laughs> the top people, you get, you're you the one you can you can pick your, your song for karaoke night there at uh, Galen Night. You know, yeah. Yeah. Number 86, Lady in Red. Lady in Red. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing with me. You know, it's funny, man. But uh, listen, man, I'm, I'm excited for you guys. For those of you who've been watching this, make sure you follow Money Coach K, Kelroy Kohatsu. On Instagram and social media. Diana Joe, what's yours again? It says at Diana Joe. At Diana.joe. Diana.joe, also on Instagram. Watch their stories. If you're like, no, nah, these are such cool people. They can't be that easy. It can't be that, no, no, listen, first of all, they work. They work. They put in their hours. But go into stories, go into Instagram stories and watch them behind the scenes. Watch them do their thing. I mean, this is this isn't rocket science. This isn't pre-med. This isn't um, you, know, you know algebra or anything like that. This is having conversation with average and ordinary people in the multicultural middle class about getting real with their finances, about getting real with their financial future, and just like Diana and Kelroy, you know, securing their income. I mean, the most important thing you can do is secure your income because you're, after that, you're saving an investment. It just, just flows right through, and it's exciting to know that uh, you make this much money, your expenses are this much. You took this much money and saved and invest and carried forward into the next month. Well, that's kind of like the exciting things. I used to be the guy that carried nothing. Matter of fact, carried negative balance in the military for it into the next month. I'm wondering where my money is going. But uh, guys, you're huge, huge ass. I'm, I'm honored to call you guys partners. Honored to call you guys uh, uh, fellow Polynesian, Asian invasions. And most of all, glad to call you guys friends. And uh, the next chapter is opening up for you guys. I'm excited to see what that inf unfolds. And I'm looking forward to seeing how fast you guys get to seven figure and being officially part of the seven figure squad. We're coming. Appreciate it. We appreciate that. That being said, guys, hey guys, for those of you who are watching this, make sure you follow, make sure you click like, follow our business page. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click uh, uh, subscribe, hit notification, be alert, uploaded next time we upload our next video. Make sure you share this with somebody that you know. So you know what? Is the money game really that hard? Watch Diane and Carol break it down for you and how their experience has been here in the insurance industry and more specifically, with PHP agency as they lead their firm called Cornerstone. Oh yeah. Till we meet again on behalf of Diana and Carroy. Till we meet again. Continue smart. Continue smart. And be mighty smart today. <laughs>